Hey guys, it's Jeff. Uh, today I'm going to be reviewing a book called Lifeblood by Gina Showalter, which is book two in the Everlife series. It is the sequel to First Life, which I also have a book review for. So if you haven't uh, watched that one yet, I definitely would recommend that just so you're not lost in this one. And so no real spoilers happen. Um, it was released in 2017 and it is 441 pages long. Um, now, this one is much better than First Life. Um, if uh, if you haven't seen my, my First Life review, I gave it a 3 out of 5, which is pretty average. Um, this one is much better than that one. It's not perfect, but um, I said it in the first review, and I'll say it in this one again. This book should have been the first book in the series. Um, at the end of First Life... Uh, Tenley chooses Troika as her um, realm that she wants to pledge her life to. And the main plot in this one is her um, exploration through Troika, learning their, their um, system called the grid where everybody's connected and they can share light between each other, learning the different um, positions of all of the jobs that everybody has and just basically how Troika runs and her first and main assignment throughout this book is ends up being um, protecting two humans who have been infected with penumbra. Now penumbra is a disease that is rumored to be real in Troika, but it is a meridian disease where um, uh, myriad infects humans with shadows so that they eventually will become abrogates. So essentially, Myriad has figured out how to artificially create an abrogate um, rather than them just occurring naturally. Um, and if, if you remember, if you are re watching this for the first time, um, an abrogate on the, in the Myriad, on Myriad's side is the highest position that a human can attain. So Tenley Lockwood... Her position is a conduit where she can draw light from the grid uh, at a much higher rate than everybody else and can share it among other people. Um, and then the equivalent position in Myriad is an abrogate so they can gather shadows and share it among their people. Um, conduits can uh, dispel shadows away and then abrogates can push light away. So they're kind of like equal... Um, positions just on opposite realms. Um, but not only is that dangerous for Troika because they are basically committed to defeating shadows, but it's it's very destructive to humans because number one, they uh, it is only rumored to exist and now they actually have proof that penumbra is a real disease. Uh, not only that, but they don't know how contagious it is. So they don't know if it can become a an epidemic among humans and even among Troikans. They don't want it to get into their realm to possibly destroy them and weaken them. Um, and they don't know what the actual effects are on humans. So far, um, Ten's uh, mission has been to protect two humans called uh, named Dior and Javier. And they have been infect. They are the first known cases to be uh, infected with penumbra, and it's her job to basically protect them so that no other meridians go after them, and to kind of monitor the effects of penumbra because they're not sure how to get rid of it yet without actually harming the humans. Um. So, compared to the other book, um. Like I, like I mentioned before, Lifeblood needed to be the first book in the series, in my opinion. Everything that happened in First Life, I think, could have been summed up at the beginning of Lifeblood. Um, because, li because First Life, to me, just kind of felt a little too stretched out. Uh, it would have been more believable to me if everything that happened in First Life was... Uh, brought up as memories of tens in lifeblood and kind of 
you know, the series should have started with her in Troika and then uh, her recalling those details of her first life that, you know, and uh, that uh, ended up getting her to where she is now because as as at the time of this review i'm already halfway through everlife which is the third book in the series the final book and i was hoping that she would have become this badass hard ass conduit by the end of the third book or at least gotten a lot of training and so far um she's you know thrust and well, not thrust um but you know is I guess thrust into this conduit position where she's very unskilled with it. She's always asking for help. There's really there's only one other known conduit in existence, which which is uh, Princess Marie, who's engaged to Aaron, who is the second king of um, of uh, Troika. So she doesn't really get any direct training from her yet, and she's kind and sh she's basically just learning. For you know, uh, a lot of the book just learning from her general, um, general Levi how to fight, how to you know build up stamina, and it was a little there was a little disconnect there for me because like if Lifeblood would have been the first book in the series, you, that's what you would expect from the first book, and then you could have two books after that if they you know if it was still going to be a trilogy two books after that for her to really build up her strength and her conduit powers. Um, but I don't get that feeling here because it's the second book. She's just now learning her powers, you know, throughout this book and even um, th throughout Everlife so far. Um, we don't, we don't really see a lot of strength from her. Like she's, her character is strong, but her conduit powers are still at that like beginner level, which is which was a little disappointing because I think that would have been so cool if she could have all these, you know, limitless uh, this limitless power by the end of the third book. Um, so, with that said, um, the first half of the book, Ten really hasn't learned. Um, the step-by-step -step process of each division of labor in in Troika, which is like it, it seems like it, it's it's very confusing. Gina's made it very confusing as to what the ranks are because honestly, throughout the book, like to me, the ranks don't really matter. Like it doesn't it doesn't really show, um, you know, messengers um, trying to you know recruit people. Um, even, even now I'm, you know, I'm, I've been reading this series for the past couple months now, and I, I can't even really name all of the positions up off, off the top of my head because the like they're the positions roles in the book, um, are not, are really not that important. It seems, um, you know, when, when, uh, 10 needs help and her leaders are sending, you know, different people to help her. It's almost like their positions don't really matter. They're all just in it together, which is fine. But um, Gina seems to place these roles as if they're, you know, specifically designed to do certain things. But it it wasn't that believable in my in my opinion. Um, one of the positions that doesn't exist in first life is a healer, uh, which is only in Troika. So I, I, obviously a healer will heal you. Um, Troika is, is um, or Troikans are powered by, like powered is a weird word, but they get their stamina from mana. Um, which is basically just like a vial and they drink the liquid if they're feeling weak or if they have an injury, they can drink the mana to heal them um, and to just give them like that extra boost of strength that's almost like an instantaneous healing. Although it's kind of weird because like they're always saying, oh, I ran out of mana, I don't have enough mana and they, they only carry it in a, in a small vial around their neck. Like you would think that in an eternal realm, I mean, they've got mana fields where they're, you know, 
almost like a, like a crop field where they're um, harvesting this manna. But you'd think that they would have like 50 necklaces around their around their necks and you know extra vials all in these like pockets in their in their shirts and stuff. They always they only seem to be carrying a uh, carrying around one tiny vial of manna. Uh, and they always seem to be running out, so you'd think they would learn from that. That's just a weird side note. Um, uh, what I did really like about this one, though, I'm um, just going off my notes here, is that Killian is doing a great job of playing both sides to the point where I can't actually, I can't tell whether he's actually on Myriad's side or if he's actually falling in love with Ten. Because... One page, he's reporting to his generals saying, um, you know, I've got Tenley in my grasp. She's totally smitten with me. Um, we're going to get her to defect or, you know, hurt her realm. But then the next page, he's telling her how much he loves her. And honestly, I, I really couldn't. It, it was the writing was done really well to the point where I couldn't I couldn't lean one way or the other. I thought, I mean, most of the time, like in this genre of book, um, obviously, the love uh, you know, the love story is going to end up as a love story. But I, to me, I was like, you know what? If if Killian betrays her and ends up being for Myriad, I mean, that would be a cool twist because that's the type of thing that you wouldn't normally see in a series like this. Um, so that was really good. I like that. Um, this In this book, if you remember from the First Life review, um... Tenley is her name is her nickname is Ten, so she's obsessed with numbers, and those stupid number examples that I that I hated so much from the first book still exist throughout this one, but they become more scarce as the book progresses. So it's not like all the time. Like first life was littered with them, and it was so annoying. But Lifeblood, as it goes on, it steadily decreases, and so far in like Everlife book three, I think I've only come across one example of it and it was an actually useful example and this is where i wish gina would have actually put those numbers to good use where one of one of um the characters is trapped and she's blinking this like three fingers on both hands signal to them and they're trying to figure out what it is that she's trying to tell them about you know the situation where she's trapped and 10 uses her numbers. Oh, it could be, you know, she flashes uh, six, three times. So like this, two, three. And she's like, well, it could be six, six, six. It could be 18 something. It could be three of this, three of that. And that was a situation where I'm like, okay, these number examples make sense. But um, throughout the book, I think if I can pull this example up, I think I have the number in my head, the page number. Um, it's just really... Like most of the examples don't matter, and it's just like, you know, let let's see. Um, shoot, hold on, let me check my notes real quick. Okay, so this is the number example that I'm talking about. That is just like completely random. That just it's like so stupid when you read it to me. I, you know, um, okay, so after all, ten is ten, and there are always different ways to say the same thing. Two times five equals ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Greater than nine, but less than eleven. And then there's like ten stars. Uh, X. Eleven minus one equals ten. A dime. A decade. Decem. Deeks. Like I'm gonna show you this page here. Hopefully that translates, and I'll just leave it there for a second. If you want to pause that and just look at it, you know. And it, it's like these these examples. They don't really matter. You know, it, they're not useful. It's just like this extra gimmicky thing that she threw in here, and I and I go through that in detail in the first in the first book. Um, but in in that one situation where she's trying to figure out the numbers, like that was useful, and I didn't mind that, and I actually was like, that that's helpful. Like that that's 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 fine. Like I'm okay with that. But um, so lifeblood, it doesn't have as many. It still exists, but then ever life, I've only had that one example so far, and it's like. Okay, let's let's go with that one. Um, one thing that I noticed in in Lifeblood is ten as as ten is supposed is is coming off, and so far has revealed herself to be this independent, hard ass character. Not hard ass, but like 
doesn't take crap from anybody really type of character. But there's moments that I felt that were kind of childish that kind of took away from her character that didn't seem to like fit really well. Um, she has certain times where she'll say like, um, she'll see something that someone is wearing that's really beautiful or like a cool type of weapon. She'll be like, ooh, gimme, 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 gimme. And, oh, I can never turn out a gift. You know, this this type of thing where it seems to like clash with her independent, uh, you know, I'm not going to take any attitude from anyone. It just kind of like, she's very adult. It, she's only 17, and she, but she's she's very, uh, you know, uh, mature in some instances, but then when things like those quotes come up, gimme and I can never turn down a gift, just really strange and kind of seems outside of her character that I that I that I didn't really care for. Um now here's here's another um position of labor uh, another division of laborer that I thought was completely useless. Uh and we don't learn about it until about halfway through Lifeblood. It's called a barrister. Now, in certain situations, if, let's say, I pledged my life to Troika and I'm human, or even if I'm in Troika already, I can go to court. Well, no, let me, that, sorry, that bad example. I'll use Myriad as an example because so far this only seems to be happening with Meridians. If I'm if I've made covenant with Myriad and I've agreed to go to their realm and I'm still human, if I feel like I was tricked or I just changed my mind, I can go to court and say, I think I made a mistake. I'd like to actually go to Troika instead. So they have a trial. Um, people from Myriad uh, replay scenes from your life saying, you're a terrible person. You don't deserve the type of, you know, uh, family team building that Troika offers. You're more about all yourself. You're really selfish. Um, you know, you, you play into your indulgences and this is why you deserve to be in Myriad. So they try to berate the person to try to, you know, keep them on Myriad. But what a barrister does is if I'm a spirit, I'm saying, I'm going to vouch for you. So if um, either way, if you, like, if I'm a Meridian barrister, uh, I'm going to vouch for you. And um, if you lose, the losing side, or the, 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 both sides provide a barrister. The losing side, the barrister dies because there is a blood contract in place where uh, if um, uh, they die in place of the human if it doesn't go their way. So it's like if I'm vouching for someone and they, you know, lose or they stay on that side, then I'm the one that dies because of, you know, this blood contract that's in place where, you know, somebody has to pay the price. And I was like, really? That seems so like, it seems so silly. Why would someone have to die in order for someone? Because like, say I'm a barrister and I'm vouching for this guy over here and we're both on the same side. Um... Or if, you know, if I'm on the other side, technically, if he loses, nobody's lost a contract. Nobody's lost a soul. Nobody's out of, we're all in the same position as we were before. But yet someone has to die because I wanted to switch sides or this person wanted to switch sides and they didn't. To me, it would make more sense if I was the barrister and they did successfully switch sides, then I would die. Because in that case, there is one side that lost a soul. And it just seems very childish or, or very like, not childish, but like very ridiculous um, because there is no indication that being a barrister is mandatory. In fact, the judge who resides over these proceedings um, at one point asks one of the, you know, like when we're first introduced to it, are you okay with being a barrister for this person? And he says, yes, I, I agree to the terms. It's like, it's like, who would volunteer for that? I, I wouldn't volunteer for that. Um, you know, for a stranger, uh, that's, that seems, that seems strange. 
Um, uh, so it seems voluntary, and there's not like some type of lottery where they pick a name where it's just you know, like jury duty where you, you like you pick a name and you have to do it. There's no, there's nothing like that. It seems all voluntary, and like who would volunteer for that? I don't know. I don't get it. Um, and they consider this court area um, the first king's like final judgment, although the first king is not the judge in the courtroom. Whatever is decreed goes, you know. Um, but the thing is, is like, why wouldn't the first king, if if it's considered his final word, why would he like actually allow people to die? I wonder. Um, wouldn't couldn't he rule? You know, that all all the realms be at peace. That's that's. I'm telling you guys, you have to make up right now, or else there's going to be consequences. You know, that seems that that seems more. Um, adequate of a of a solution than letting his sons go at war with each other. I mean, he's the creator of everything. These people are going at war with each other, killing each other. Some some are, um, you know, it's revealed that in first life. So I'm not really spoiling anything here. That myriad is connected to many ends. They have yet to really prove this, but rather than meridians being fused um 10 believes when they die when they experience second death 10 believes that myriad souls go to many ends when they die rather than being fused with another human so i'm wondering why the first king would allow all of his you know creations to be warring with each other killing each other and then have the potential to go to a realm that you know tortures them tortures them for eternity after they experience second death um, you know, and, and to continue with that, I mean, the first king actually rules over the rest. So that's revealed. That's not really a shocker. Um, that's his kingdom. So Troikans, after they experience second death, they go to the rest, which is basically another eternal life. So it's kind of like, why wouldn't like you have first life? And then you have your ever life in Troika, where you can still die. And then after you die in Troika, then you go to the rest, which is another eternal like life. Why wouldn't why wouldn't you just go to the rest immediately after first life? It seems uh, because there's no way to actually get to the rest because it's completely closed off from the, both the realms. Um, I mean, not not Troika completely because they can resurrect one person each year to come back to life. But why why couldn't you just go to from first life to the rest? Because then Troikans would be completely safe from from Myriad. You know, if Myriad wants to war with each other or war with themselves, like whatever. But it seems kind of silly to have like this in between, uh, you know this in-between realm if the rest is the ultimate destination and it's basically the same as your ever life except you're completely at peace why not just go to the rest from the beginning um so with um so i'm wondering how many ends came into existence because i can't imagine that the first king would say sorry you didn't make a decision now you're going to be tortured forever that doesn't seem right. I'm thinking that he had Myriad and Troika existing. And then when Ambrosine, who is the second king of Myriad, decided to war against Troika, that somehow his um, jealousy and anger that created all these shadows maybe created another realm that was an extension of his viciousness where um, it's, you know, rather than them going to the rest some kind of weird power happened where instead of going, instead of meridians going to the rest also, now they go to many ends to be tortured as like, as a direct consequence of Ambrosine wanting too much power and him, you know, uh, being infected with this, like this shadow, you know, in his heart. Um, now, <laughs> we don't even know what Myriad looks like. Um, 
all throughout lifeblood, we are kind of experiencing troika through Ten's eyes, but not once do they ever show us what Myriad looks like. They don't show us in first life, except for the brief glimpses that Ten gets. Um, just, just really quick glimpses of what Killian shows her when she's still human. Um, and throughout Lifeblood, we don't, we have no idea what what Myriad looks like. And I'm halfway through Everlife, and you know, it it gets revealed, you know, eventually. But which I so I'm kind of torn. I'm kind of torn because I I'd wish that I could have seen Myriad sooner because like halfway through Everlife, that's when we start to see it for you know reasons that I won't spoil here. But I'm torn between okay, you can wait that long because it's more suspenseful, but I don't want to wait that long because we're half we're almost done with the entire series and we haven't seen what myriad looks like yet. So again it goes back to if we would have left if we would have left first life out and had everlife be the second book then it's like halfway through the second book we see myriad no problem. Like that's I'm fine with that. But when the series is almost over and you don't get a glimpse of the opposing realm yet I kind of I'm kind of 50-50 in that. I mean more like 60-40. I'd rather have seen myriad sooner, but you know now that I'm reading everlife it's a little bit more suspenseful which is a little more acceptable, but anyway. Um, which brings me to an idea. Gina, if you're listening, or if anyone wants to share this to her, or whatever, um, and I'm going to mention this in the Everlife uh, review coming up next. Um, make a prequel. Make a prequel showing the first king um, creating the realms giving them to his sons, show the dispute between them, and show the war that started between Myriad and Troika, and call it Torchlight. That would be awesome. Um, in, in Lifeblood and Everlife, uh, Torchlight is a situation that a Troikan will get into where if they're dying, they can give all of their light that is remaining within their body to help someone as a character does with 10. Um, And they basically explode from the inside out because they're gathering all their excess light that they've stored throughout the realm and within themselves to give to someone else to help them, to help heal them. Um, Because if they they already know that they're dying, I don't want my light to go to waste, so I'm going to send it to you. Um, And that's called Torchlight. And I think that would be the coolest prequel. That should have been the third book. It could have been Lifeblood, Everlife, and then a prequel called Torchlight. Um, I want to see a war between Myriad and Troika, how it first started. That would be cool. Because since we don't see a lot of Myriad, obviously we don't see a lot of Ambrosine, who is the second king of of Myriad. And that kind of makes him more mysterious, I guess. So I'm kind of, you know, torn between that. Um, Makes him more mysterious. But I want to see, I want to see his viciousness. I want to see his ruthlessness. Um, We... Don't see the first king at all in Lifeblood. We don't see the first king at all. I want to see more first king. I want to see him interfere. I want to see him give his opinions on things. Um, I mean, he rules over the rest, and it, and and it's and it's mentioned that he does visit the realms every once in a while. And Ten says um, that she's seen him in you know like those glimpses that. Um, uh, Archer in in uh, First Life, Archer's given her a glimpse and she's seen what the First King looks like, but we don't get any direct um, contact with him. He doesn't visit the realm so far in Lifeblood. Um, I want to see more of him and a prequel would be the perfect way to do it because it could show how he created the realms, what they looked like at the beginning, how they've changed over time what his purpose was behind it like why why you know why why only two realms why only two suns why did you create humans did you create the entire universe who knows that would be really cool um 
So in my opinion, it should have been Lifeblood, Everlife, and then Torchlight as a prequel. So that would have been cool. Um, and at its core, this whole series is a a love story. It's you know between Ten and Killian, and throughout this book, I'm I still wasn't really buying their love for each other. Um, towards the end of it, I, it was a little bit more believable, um, and I was actually enjoying it a little more. But um, for most of the series so far, it just wasn't. It just didn't feel authentic to me. Um, and then again, this goes back to uh, making, you know, leaving first life out, rather than showing us how Ten met Killian and and seeing their relationship progress that way i would have rather have you know when if if lifeblood was the first book said i love a boy named killian and so that so that way it's starting off saying i i love him here's how we're moving forward from this point and like here's how we met rather than like going through the slow process of showing them how they met and you know doing that to me it would have been more interesting if she started the series with I love Killian and then so that forces me to say okay she loves him and Killian loves her back and then and then go forward from that rather than showing the slow process um so it's more believable towards the end of lifeblood and pretty believable actually the way that everlife the direction that everlife is taking um which which is really cool um so um this book is not perfect, but it is exponentially better than First Life. I would highly recommend Lifeblood to you. What it does well is um, showing what Troika looks like. It is described as the epitome of beauty, the way that they travel around the city between gates where it, you know, since they're spirits, they can basically teleport. They walk through a gate and it will transport them to a different parts of the city. And then, you know, within that city, they use stairwells, which are kind of like smaller gates, I think, to, to travel around. Um, um, she learns how to use a shell, which is basically a like human skin so that they can interact with people in, in the land of the harvest, which is Earth. Um, so the descriptions of, of Troika are done really well. Um, Killian playing both sides. I thought was done really well because because I couldn't tell whether he was being truthful or not. Um, and overall, this one just had a better uh, like flow of energy to it because we're finally in the realms. Because in first life, you want to learn more about them. At least I was saying, um, you know, I want to know more about the the lore of the realms and experience more of that. And in Lifeblood, we finally get it because Ten is now in Troika. And and is experience, experiencing that you know side of her ever life. Um, what it doesn't do well, in my opinion, is um, Gina seems to kind of like take a long time to get to the point of things. Um, it takes too long to reveal. You know, so far we don't know what Myriad looks like. I want to see more Ambrosine. I want to see more First King. Um, just feels like things are left out for the purpose of being left out so that they can be, you know, brought up later on as, as more suspenseful. So I'm kind of like torn on that of obviously of, do I want to see it right now? I'd rather see it right now because I want to ex- get more of an experience with that. But then if they don't show it until later, it's more suspenseful. Um, and, um, yeah. And then another, and then like the last thing I'd say is that, um, you know the, the positions to me and the, the different divisions of of laborer within the book just don't seem to matter as that much. Um, there's really no direct; they really have no like direct influence on the story to me, uh, except for like the healer. Maybe the healers obviously heal people, and just little tiny things that like the mana thing like why wouldn't you just grab more mana why carry around one one vial just little things like that that um uh 
aren't like really big problems. It's just like you'll probably notice like small things in every book that like inconsistencies, but that wasn't the, like th- those little inconsistencies aren't really enough to bring it down. Um, so overall, I'd have to give this book a four out of five. Uh, it is, whereas First Life was pretty average, this one is above average. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's it was actually making me want to read more and you know fly through it. It, it had a it had a good momentum to it where uh, I I felt like I was you know on a on a trajectory rather than like uh, where First Life it was kind of like you know an, as I call it an information dump where they just throw everything at you. This one was a little more. Um, spaced out a little bit and then and then the pace you're like the pace is kind of like pretty steady and kind of you know ramps up towards the end um so four out of five i highly recommend this book and this series to you um as much as i say that first life shouldn't be a part of the series as a fact it is so if you want to read the series obviously start with first life and then maybe you'll see what I mean once you get to Lifeblood where everything could have been summarized. Um, my next book review will be Everlife, which is the third book. And I'm halfway through that. And I can I can say it's, it's going pretty well so far. Um, so like, dislike this video, leave a comment, subscribe if you want to. Drop a drop a comment if you and if if you have any book suggestions for me. I'm always open to taking those. Um, and I'll, I'll put them on my list and I'll try to do a book review for them if it sounds interesting to me. Um, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys on the next one.